So as you can see, we're using the XI robot for those who weren't here for the last case. So I use the XI exclusively um, for probably the last couple thousand cases. And um, we have the patient obviously um, positioned in full flank. So the patient's in 90 degree flank. And as you'll see here, uh, once we get internal, the nice thing about using full 90 degrees as opposed to 45 or 60 is that it really helps get the bowel down. So you'll see how uh, we're able to get the uh, duodenum out of the way and all those kind of things. Uh, and then we've got a four-port approach, so I'm not using the fourth arm, as you can see from the robot. Uh, I only use the fourth arm on retroperitoneal partial nephrectomies. I don't use it on transperitoneals. Uh, so we're going to have two robotic instruments and one assistant port in the right lower quadrant. So do you have the slides up? Do you have the, um, the slides there introducing the case? Yeah, we're switching back to the slides now. Okay, great. So maybe somebody else can... Um, I don't see the slides. I'm going to start reflecting the colon here. So maybe somebody else can just kind of go through the slides with the audience. It's pretty straightforward. One second. Okay, slides are up. I think he wants us to do it, right? Yeah, okay. go ahead, please. Well, welcome back, Ronnie. Uh, Clayton and I are here. Uh, we're going to just read through the patient slide, okay? Yep, so with this a 57-year-old uh, um, who basically fell and under, uh, you know, sustained a rib fracture, the CT of the chest uh, incidentally found a renal mass. I guess the patient uh, elected against surgery, and they were kind of following this. And the MRI subsequently um, demonstrated a little bit of growth. It's now 3.8 centimeters. Um, they spoke to the medical oncologist, and uh, they were referred for surgery. Um, it seems like the BMI is about 20, 24, history of lung surgery, fairly healthy otherwise. And uh, here we have the images. So it looks like a, you have the vascular images there. Yeah, I just wanted to point out there on the vascular images from the scan, that it looks like he has an early branching right renal artery. So the implications oh, yeah. for that, as you can see there, it's branching just to, the, uh, just to the left side of the vena cava. So the implications for that is that if we try to clamp on the right side of the cava, as we usually do, we're going to have probably three or four different branches by then. So we may end up having to go intraarterial caval to, uh, to get control of the artery and just be able to place one clamp on it. The other option would be to actually dissect out each of those vessels and then do a selective clamp, but this guy is a healthy guy with normal renal function, normal contralateral kidney. Uh, selective artery clamping in his case would be purely elective and probably overkill wouldn't make a difference to his long-term outcome. So I'm planning to do a main artery clamp, basically. Any objections uh, from the panel? No, I think no, it seems that would be reasonable. Absolutely. Yep. So we're going to go back to the uh, operating room view. Okay. All right. Where we, where we can see you now. Okay, great. So uh, I'm just reflecting the colon. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this is the Gerotas. Uh, Ronnie, it's Jay here. Do you do any uh, preoperative renal scans for function or on select patients or all patients? What's your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't routinely, honestly. The only time I would is if I had a patient who was really on the borderline of nephrectomy versus partial, and I wanted mm -hmm. to know, you know, how essential is it that we do a partial on this patient? You know, if, uh, you know, for example, if you have a patient with a really large mass normal contralateral kidney, and you're thinking, well, you know, this is an eight centimeter mass or something, it's feasible to do a partial, but should I really do it? Then I might do a renal scan, and if the renal scan is showing, you know, 50-50 function, then I might be more likely to do a nephrectomy, whereas if it's showing, you know, the patient actually needs that kidney, then I would go for a partial. But not routinely, I don't routinely do it. Do you do anything, anything different, Jay? Do you routinely do one, just for documentation no. purposes? Pretty similar to what you were saying, complex mass, uh, maybe more endophytic mass, um, concern for nephrectomy. Yeah, same here. Pre existing I CKD, something yeah. like that, yeah. yeah. 
we notice you don't have a liver retractor. What are your thoughts on the? Uh, yeah, this is that? a this is a lower pole mass. So, you know, once we get the hilum dissected out, um, you know, we won't really need any liver retraction for any reason. We're not going to have to go really high up on the kidney here. So we, we're probably not going to need it. I think once we get this duodenum cocorized here, we're going to see what we need to see. Do we have any questions from the audience? <laughs> any, any, any thoughts? We have a question. What, which oh, which lens are you using? Oh. This is 30 down. I use 30 down for the whole case. So I do all upper tract surgery at 30 down. And um, unless I'm doing a, a retro partial, you know, retro perineal, I'll use 30 up. So here's our cava, and you can see here there's already artery right here. So we may get lucky here. Hold this, Renee. It's Ronnie, it's uh, Clayton here. So it's a quick question uh, for the ports. Did you just do a straight line on this one or what was your port configuration for the three ports? Yeah, so I didn't, um, you know, when the XI robot came out, they told us, oh, you can do, you know, straight line ports and you can go, you know, lateral with your ports. I, I didn't change what I was doing with the previous robots. I just okay. uh, still still use my, you know, standard four port configuration. I still put the uh, camera port at the umbilicus because I want to have the most, the most uh, medial port for the camera as possible so I can get as panoramic as necessary, especially if you're flipping the kidney. If you're doing a transparent nail and you're flipping the kidney, you want to have your yeah. camera as medial as possible. Otherwise, you might be looking backwards on the kidney. So I keep the, ki the uh, camera port at the umbilicus and then I extract at the umbilicus so I don't have to cut through any muscle and that, that I believe is uh, helpful for the patients in terms of post-operative pain. question so uh ronnie it's played again so another uh -huh. question for the audience where you're uh, where's your assistant port so the assistant port is in the right lower quadrant okay so it's um it's between the camera port and the left robotic arm port the left robotic yeah. instrument So here is a artery. I don't know which, if this is the main artery, if it's already branched or what's happened here. Well, we're gonna query it and see what, uh, what we find here. Jay and I were good, uh, joking around. This is your typical California patient, <laughs> yeah. not Ohio. <laughs> BMI 24. <laughs> yeah, no previous abdominal surgery. Yeah, we tried to pick some uh, easier ones for um, you know for demonstration purposes, so that we don't uh, yeah. get any untoward surprises. And this, I think, um, you know, although you know we could have picked much more difficult masses to tackle, 
I think, um, you know, this is kind of a medium difficulty tumor. Uh, it's about uh, almost four centimeters in, in size, but it's really egg-shaped, which is going to present some challenges in terms of planning the, uh, the resection. And um, so it'll help us, you know, it'll be kind of a nice demonstration of, suck down here, it'll be a nice demonstration of the um, ultrasound, use of the ultrasound to figure out exactly where we need to go. And now, Ronnie, your um, your assistant is once again an air seal for it, right? With the new apparent name of also yeah. at six. No, we've got normal. We're using normal uh, pneumo pressure here. Um, we uh, you know we tend to use uh, more normal pressures on these kidney cases simply because you know the um, the bowel doesn't fall away as well as it does on uh, on pelvic cases where gravity does the retracting. So we tend to use 12 or 15 on the kidneys, but uh, sometimes we'll turn them down if we can. You know, especially if we're doing like a ureal reconstruction case or something, we'll purposely turn it down so that we're not uh, making the gap between the healthy ends of the ureter longer than they need to be. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, not what I expected. I From the scan, it looked like it branched into three different uh, branches behind the cava. So I'm not sure if this is what we're going to be clamping here, but we have an easy way that we can test it here in a moment. And I guess we'd like to hear your thoughts on um, clamping uh, the artery or clamping the artery and the vein or, um, you know, and then two two clamps on the artery, though, so on and so forth. So, what are your thoughts as you're as you're dissecting the hilum? What do you think? Uh, what are you thinking about? Yeah. So um, my routine is just to clamp the artery, not the vein. Let me have a vessel loop here, please. So um, you know, I haven't clamped the vein in years. I, I really never clamp the vein, just the artery. Um, you know, I'm, I don't think it's bad just you know never do it and um, and uh, my routine is to do early on clamping so I routinely do early on clamping regardless of complexity how about you dr. while you uh, clamp the vein also or I only do the vein for a complex Partials, very deep partials. But I'm only an artery, artery only. Mm -hmm. I usually do two clamps. I don't know, just uh, voodoo. Yeah. I feel like just make sure it has good closure. Um, I do approach a hilum a little different. I think that I go inferiorly, find the ureter, mm -hmm. and come up. But this is certainly a much more efficient way. You on a medial approach. Um, yeah. yeah on, the, he, on the right side, that. there's really not. Um, on the right side, you really don't need to find the ureter because the cave is right there as soon as you cocorize the duodenum. So usually that's what I'm doing is I, I just cocorize the duodenum. So here's our tumor. Uh, are you guys seeing the Talipro view, I hope? We, we see it. it. Yeah, okay. We see it. it. Looks good. So, um, so usually once you cocorize the duodenum on the right side, you see the vena cava, and then you can very easily see where the renal vein is coming off. And then you just come to that crotch between the renal vein and the vena cava, and that's where your renal artery is usually going to be. So here I'm just pulling on this to see if my Doppler signal is uh, going away. Still seeing flow though. It's better. So now when I let go, the flow should come back. So can you, can you see the difference there? So when I pull yeah. on it, yep. the flow is going away. Yep. Yep. And then when I let go, it should come back. There it is. So that's telling me that if I clamp that artery, I should be okay. I should have a bloodless field right here, um, you know, when we do the uh, resection. The other option we can do, too, is we can actually, more than the vessel loop, we can actually pinch the artery. And that gives us even better. So you can see that's even better occlusion. Yeah. So that makes me feel better that that is the artery, even though, it, again, it looked very different on the scan. Rotated there. 
So obviously this thing is made to be uh, used with the ProGrasp. With this uh, little notch right here, but I don't use the ProGrasp, so I'd have to waste a, an instrument life just to do the ultrasound, so that's why I just kind of make do. All right, so actually, um, before I take that away, let me have that back for one second. So the Doppler, you can see there, helped us with figuring out the perfusion. Now I'm just gonna figure out where do I wanna clean off the kidney. So it looks like the tumor comes up to here. It's going there, so we'll just kinda clean this area. And it's kind of a lateral tumor, so we're gonna probably flip the kidney a little bit towards us here to get the best possible look at it. Ideally, when we're doing the resection, we wanna have the tumor staring us end on. So I wouldn't, if a tumor's sticking out this way, I don't wanna cut it out this way. I wanna turn it so that the tumor's sticking at me and then I can cut under it. So that's what we're gonna try to achieve here by rotating the kidney a little bit. So one thing that I tell surgeons who do these procedures or somebody who might be still learning how to do it, I tell them, you know, your ischemia time is gonna be about, you know, 10, 15 minutes, but your operative time is gonna be about two to three hours. So that means that you're spending, you know, 10 times the amount of time on setting it up so that your ischemia time is short. We have a question for you. Uh, when you're planning to uh, medialize the kidney, do you typically do that inside of Gerotas or outside of Gerotas? Uh, I do that, um, I leave the kidney within Gerotas. So I'm doing it like you would when you're doing a nephrectomy. So um, basically, you know, when you do a nephrectomy, obviously you're taking out everything in Gerotas. So I just, I do that same thing. I don't clamshell the fat, in other words, I just leave the fat on the kidney and I uh, rotate the whole kidney. But, you know, either way is fine. Both work. So would anybody have biopsied this tumor? It's kind of a controversial topic these days. <laughs> We're getting head shaking no. Most people are saying no in the audience. Yeah. Good. That's my, how I feel about it too. Yeah, obviously this is a young guy, he's 50 something, he's uh, healthy, he's gonna live another 20, 30 years. And um, you know, the likelihood uh, of this being a renal cell is about 90%. So, um, you know, we're just taking it out. I think there was a debate this year at the AUA I saw on the schedule there was supposed to be a hmm. debate. I don't know who won. It's the renal wars, so nobody won. Yeah. Nobody won, Ronnie. Nobody won? Oh, I was no. going to say, if the audience was saying no biopsy, maybe the no biopsy guys won. The renal wars will go on. <laughs> so I noticed you have a um, little bit of like indurated toxic kind of fat. Yeah, he's a young That's man. It's, it's always the little young bit. man. Yeah. So kind of working a little bit toward against you there, but you, you're doing a nice job of peeling it off. Do you ever turn up the cautery here to uh, assist you? Uh, no, I haven't tried that. Does it work? <laughs> I have it. If it's indurated, I don't know. Yeah. I just take my time here. I mean, it's just gotta be patient. Fat. It's uh, sometimes I'll just use a little more some bipolar, but it's gotta be patient to take this stuff off. It's a, sometimes it bleeds more than other times, but I think it's obviously one of the most critical portions. Yeah, that's why I was saying, you know, 90% of the case is set up. If you try to cut corners, you pay for it when you go on clamp. 
So, um, you know, take the time that you need to to set it up, clean up, clean off as much fat as you need to see what you need to see, not only to cut the tumor out, but also to reconstruct the kidney. So there's a question from the audience about your uh, cautery settings, Ronnie. Yeah, same as the prostate that we did before. So, um, you know, if we were using the Irby, which, you know, I think you're hearing some of the feedback from the cautery. It was even worse when we were using the Irby. That's why we had to switch it. But uh, we were just getting a lot of feedback for some reason. I think there's some kind of interference coming. But uh, usually with the Irby, we would use uh, four on the monopolar, three on the bipolar. Uh, but this is just a regular cautery unit, just a uh, force triad bovi unit that we're using, and we're using 25, 25, and then we usually will go up to 40 once we get the bowel out of the way. Did you guys go up to 40 yet? Can you go up to 40 if you didn't already? Jay, what do you use, use for your settings? 40 and 40. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then I'm, I'm, I don't know, but sometimes I may go up to 60 if I get, you yeah. know, some toxic fat that's really a little bit oozy, you know. So, so that we don't bother you too much while you're doing your um, resection of the tumor, what, mm -hmm. what do you have on your back table now that, like your essentials, um, if we may ask? Um, essentials. Like your go-to uh, stitches and um, like a laparoscopic so. Tinsky clamp, things like that. Yeah, I don't have Any? a laparoscopic Tinsky. Um, yeah, I, I guess I don't have as much as most people have. I don't usually have a rescue stitch or anything like that. Probably a scoff law in that regard. But, um, you know, we have... Um, we have uh, the VLOX that we're going to use for the reconstruction. I use a VLOX for the deep layer, and then we have the uh, 3.0 Vicrols that we'll use once we come off clamp. All right. So, South Central. And uh, otherwise, nothing really special. What do you usually have? What, what kind of stuff do you guys usually have on your back table that I should yeah, probably have? <laughs> I'm similar to you. I just have my searchers. Uh, sometimes I'll have an, if it's a big tumor, I'll have an, I'll just make sure I have an extra V-lock uh -huh. just in case I need to put more searchers in for, for the inner repair. Uh, I used to do make a bolster just in case. Um, I don't use the bolster to reconstruction usually, but I will just kind of have it sometimes when it's bleeding, when I'm switching my instruments out to these, the needle drivers, I'll just use it to kind of push it on the, uh, the defect while we're switching my instruments, but mm -hmm. nothing, usually, nothing. No rescue stitches or anything else. Oh, EJ? It, it, it's similar. I, I usually have a couple extra rescue stitches. Sometimes, yeah. like a larger tumor or complex um, arterial anatomy may have like a laparoscopic Satinsky available. Um, not open, but in the room or outside, you know, available. Some maybe some hemostatic agents available. Flow seal. So where did Stifleman go? Did he run off? Doctor Stifleman left last night. Oh, I thought he was he giving a talk or who was that? The talk was Doctor Lau gave a talk earlier. Okay. They're running his video, I oh. think, after my after your case. Yeah. Ironic, running his video here. Oh, yeah, he so was doing a peritoneal uh, partial nephrectomy. Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah, I thought I recognized his voice. I thought he was there at the booth. <laughs> yeah. He had a 10 o'clock case this morning. Gotcha. <laughs> so, Ronnie, do you listen to music in the in the OR? Yeah, I used to, um, but uh, more recently now I don't. We, um, I just let the OR staff kind of pick whatever they want to listen to. We have divergent tastes. <laughs> <laughs> we do, um, you know, one thing that's important, though, I would say on that same line of, of uh, thinking 
is that uh, when we go on clamp, we have a sterile communication environment. So there's no music playing, uh, there's no extraneous talk. Uh, you know, we ask, uh, you know, anesthesia not to do any shift changes while we're on clamp. Uh, you know, it's, again, it's like 15 minutes, but it's important. So we, um, you know, we really try to minimize the foot traffic in and out of the room, and we put a sign outside the door. So we really try to control the environment when we're on clamp. Yeah, we have a, a checklist, like a safety checklist mm -hmm. that yeah. everybody follows. Um, and one of the first thing is we turn the music off. <laughs> Any questions from you guys for Dr. Abaza? So let me ask you guys, um, are you using Firefly for your partials? So normally if I'm uh, considering like a selective clamping situation, then, then I would employ it, but routinely I do not. Okay. Um, I like the way you did there, where you kind of did like a, your own Firefly with the testing with the vessel loop, mm -hmm. kind of ensuring the perfusion, I'm sure you, Similar application can be done when if you're going to do a segmental. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. How about you, Dr. Lau? Uh, same thing. I, I don't once I only use it for selective or if it's a really big tumor. What I'll do is I'll clamp the vessel, give the ICG just to make sure that I have good vascular control. So, um, but those are the, the two main areas that I'll use it for. So I routinely use it. Uh, essentially on every partial, but not for perfusion, for uh, margin identification. So we'll mm -hmm. see that, uh, we'll use that today here for that purpose. So I'm trying to peel this fat off uh, as one unit here rather than piecemeal, because we send this as a specimen afterwards. And then the pathologist will be able to check it for us, uh, make sure there was no fat invasion. It doesn't look like it, but you never know. All right, I'm gonna start pulling this kidney over towards me so I can get behind it. So no other questions from the audience? Nothing, uh, doesn't have to be about what I'm doing right now. It could be anything related or unrelated. <laughs> So what percentage of the uh, partials that you do are retroperitoneal versus trans? Um, I would say still the uh, minority of them are retroperitoneal. Uh, they tend to come in strings. They tend to come in uh, waves. Yeah. Like, uh, sometimes I'll do three in a row, and then I won't do one for another month or two. And uh, But, um, you know, I don't do all posterior tumors retroperitoneally, and I'll tell you why. I know some people, like for example, Jim Porter will say, you know, I draw a line, you know, along the kidney. If it's posterior, I do it retro. If it's anterior, I do it trans. And they just go by that line. I, I kind of am a little bit more hesitant to do uh, retro on some tumors, even if they're posterior. And the time that I won't would be if a tumor is really lower pole. And the reason why is because when you come in retro, you're coming in through the upper, you know, down from the upper pole looking up, and sometimes you're really close to that lower pole, especially on the right side. The right kidney, of course, is gonna be lower in the abdomen than the left kidney. And especially if somebody has a big liver, you may put your ports in for the retro and then find that you're right on top of the lower pole, or the lower pole may even be further down than you are. And that's a nightmare when that happens. So if it's a really lower pole tumor, what I've found is that it's a lot easier to do trans, because you don't have to flip the whole kidney over to get to the lower pole. And um, you're not going to have that problem of feeling claustrophobic and being right on top of the tumor if you're retro. 
So if it's so for, so for me, if it's a posterior tumor and it's mid to upper pole, I'm doing it retro. If it's lower pole, I'm still doing it trans. If it's hyler posterior, then I'm definitely going to do it retro. Because hyler posterior, doing it trans, even when you flip the kidney, you're still looking over a big hump of kidney to be able to see the backside of the hilum. It's a really hard transparent nail tumor to do. So that's kind of my thought process in terms of how I, you know, decide on whether to do retro or trans. And I should credit uh, Jim Porter on uh, me doing retro at all because uh, I was very anti-retro for a long time, and then he convinced me to go ahead and start doing them. And and uh, you know, since I started doing them a while ago, I've I've uh, you know, with his technique, by the way, you know, learning it from him, and um, you know, I've become a lot more comfortable with it and using it more and more often. How about you guys? How, how often are you doing retros? What's your decision-making process? Uh, similar to yours, um, the only challenge I've found is sometimes uh, if a patient is extremely obese, yeah. um, sometimes I've had some difficulty doing retroperitoneal, you know. Um, but you can, there's always the ability to convert to transperitoneal if needed, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but similarly, the, those lower pole tumors are ex can be extremely challenging, and sometimes you need to get some anterior kidney uh, like exposure, you know, and you can't get that necessarily if you're retroperitoneal and your camera is coming kind of coming down on it, you know. And so I agree with you; um, those lower pole masses, you really uh, need to go transperitoneal, you know. Yeah, I think most my cases are transparent nail, but the hyler posterior tumors, definitely retro. Those are always better, much better retro. Uh, what's your positioning, Dr. Baza, for um, retro perineal? Are you flexing the table and putting full flank? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I put them in 90 degrees, and then we flank, we uh, max out the uh, max out the uh, flex on the bed. Flex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of necessary. I don't think you can get around it without flexing. There's just no way. I mean, most, most of our patients, especially the obese ones, there's just no room between the rib and the, yeah. and the ASIS. Certainly the um, XI has revolutionized retroperitoneal uh, approach. I think it's made it more accessible for those who have never done it before, you know. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. I mean, you know, I was saying this earlier that when I was doing retros with the SI robot, I uh, think I was suicidal because uh, without the fourth arm, you know, you feel like you're working under the kidney the whole time. You can't move the kidney to where you want it, and you're working in this tight space. And, you know, if you've got a posterior hyalur mass, for example, you're working upside down the whole time. It's really frustrating. So the, the uh, ability to get the fourth arm in, which the SI gives you r routinely, you know, to get that fourth arm in just makes night and day difference on retro cases. So it's, for me, it's been a game changer. The SI has made it possible for me to do retros when I had all but given up on it and just was very frustrated with it. I feel like I'm giving this tumor a haircut here. <laughs> yep. The fade. <laughs> fade. But this is all part of your exposure. You're really spending the time to make your resection that much more yeah, easier. Yeah, you got to do it. You got to do it. I mean, some people would be tempted right now and say, oh, I can do it right now. Look, I'll cut the tumor out, but then you haven't cleaned off the fat on the backside. So once you get to the backside, you're just going to be a, see a big wad of fat, and you're not going to know where the uh, tumor ends and you know where the, where the kidney is back there so you've got to you got to spend the time you've got to get get things lined up for yourself and spend the time to uh, you know really idealize it before you go on clamp and I apologize that we've got a dirty camera I know but it's just uh, until we get this fat done it's going to be dirty so I'm just trying to do as much as I can and then once we get this fat cleared off we'll clean the scope and give you guys a better look here so Ryan had a question. So obviously using the XI here, do you typically target, uh, and where do you target typically for when you're at the beginning of the case? Yeah, I don't use that targeting feature. I never figured it out. 
Yeah. <laughs> They tried to teach me how to use it when the XI first came out, and I just I couldn't figure it yeah. out, so I gave up. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I would never really, I don't think it really added any benefit. Um, and when you were talking about port placement, Ronnie, I agree with you. I didn't really adopt the straight line configuration. Uh, I still kind of <clears throat> followed the similar pattern to the SI. Sometimes I may put the ports a little bit closer, but but I, they're certainly not always in a straight line. And, and like, like you do, uh, the camera port medial, I, I, I like that too, you know, near the umbilicus or at the umbilicus itself. Man, we agree I on hope. everything. <laughs> we, we're like For separated me, I, at birth. That's <laughs> <laughs> the Ohio way. That's it. the Ohio, yeah. Jihad, Dr. Cayuke's way. So I typically will use the straight line, but I'll I'll target the lower part of the kidney, but I don't think it helps that much. But sometimes on a nephro U, it does help if it's tough to get down on the pelvis um, the minority of the time. But then you can I just will retarget lower, and then it just huge difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the target thing is not a bad thing. It's a good thing, but um, I think what what um, you know if people haven't used the XI before, anyone in the audience may not have an XI. What you're going to find when you get the XI is that it's so much more nimble and flexible with port placement. Yeah. I mean, there's so much more room for error. You don't have to be so picky and perfect with where you put your ports. It's just it's more accepting of you know fudging it a little bit. So that's why you know I, I didn't really find any need for the targeting thing because um, you know you could basically just kind of fudge it and usually you're fine. You know it's rare that you ever get any kind of clashing or any kind of problems with the XI. It's amazing. You know and the arms are longer too. That's another advantage. The arms are longer so you never you know have a problem with reach. You know if you put your port too far down or too whatever you don't have to worry about it. It's going to reach and you're not going to have clashes. It's going to be fine. Okay let's clean the scope now. And then we'll do another ultrasound, this time to uh, localize the tumor. And then uh, shortly we're going to give the, uh, the ICG so that we can try to get that differential fluorescence uh, look between the tumor and the kidney. All right, so here's where the egg shape of the tumor is going to give us. Uh, thanks. Uh, so here's where the egg shape of the tumor is going to give us a little bit of uh, challenge. We're going to have to figure out our strategy here because the tumor, although you see there's a big exophytic component sticking out of the kidney, there's just as big of a component that's going into the kidney and is actually going all the way down to the sinus. So the tumor, as I showed on that one cut I gave you, it actually goes all the way down to the sinus fat. So it's really only 50-50 exophytic. So there's this much inside the kidney as well. So we're going to try to figure out with the ultrasound where we need to cut to get this out. We may end up having to cut clear down to here to get our mark. But what we don't want to do is we don't want to cut ourselves into a hole. So that's one thing with an egg-shaped tumor, you got to be careful. You don't want to make the mistake of you know chasing it down this way and then being in this big, huge hole. So you still see tumor there. So there's tumor all the way down to here. Then we lose it. So right about here is where we're going to go. And I'm just going to turn off the color here for one second. So there you see there's still tumor right there. Right there, just keep going, and then boom, we lose it. So we're going to cut down to about here. Tumor. That's tumor, 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 tumor. Gone. So we're going to be down here somewhere. So my guess is we're probably going to cut something like this. That's going to be our margin. That's good. So one thing that I'm doing with this probe, just to point out, is that I'm also rotating the head of the probe. So I'm placing it at where I plan to make my cut. I'm going to make my cut here. But I want to know, do I need to cut straight down like this, or can I cut more this way, or do I need to go more that way? 
So I'm rotating the head of the probe until I see the tumor. There's tumor there. And then I go away from it, now the tumor's gone. So the, here I can actually cut pretty shallow. On this side, I don't have to cut deep into the kidney. I can cut pretty shallow on this side. And then I'll do the same thing over here. Pull it back a little bit. So here we'll find where we're going to cut. We're going to cut here, and then I'll rotate the head. There's tumor there. And then I go away, boom. So I got to cut straight down here. I got to cut right down in this direction. I can't cut this way. If I cut this way, I'll get into the tumor. So here, but based on this rotation, that's tumor. That's not tumor. So I got to cut a little bit down in this way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's the combination of the sweep. So you sweep the probe over until you don't see the tumor anymore. And then when you get to the area where you're planning to cut, you just rotate the head and that tells you the direction of the cut. So in here, I'm not going to cut this way. Here I would get into the tumor. If I'm going to cut here, I got to cut this way a little bit. Now, if I was over here, then yes, I could cut this way. If I was over here, then I'd have to cut much more this way. So you kind of use the two cues with the ultrasound to, uh, to figure out where to go. All right, I'm sorry, let me see that ultrasound one more time. I'm going to check it up here. All right, so we're getting close now. So uh, let's make our V-lock sutures at seven inches. Now, Ronnie, at this point, have you given the ICG Not and yet. Uh, Not yet. Are, you, uh, here. are you planning on giving any mannitol? I don't uh, know. I don't use mannitol, Lasix, anything like that. Really never have. I think if you were, you know, if you were um, thinking you're going to have a longer ischemia time, mm -hmm. then maybe it would be a good idea to do so. But, you know, my ischemia time routinely is about 12 to 15 minutes or so. So um, I don't think it makes a difference at that level. I used to use it for many years, and after the randomized study at a memorial, yep. I, I, I stopped using yeah. it routinely. I mean, if, I, if it's a really complex, bad one, where I think I'm going to go in excess of 20, 25 minutes, mm -hmm. I'll do it. I'm not quite sure that'll help, but just doing it then, but rarely I'll use it. All right, so here's what I'm seeing here. This is important. So what I'm seeing here is that the tumor, the egg-shaped tumor, is not coming this way. It's actually going up that way. I'll show you here. So here we see the tumor is here. Now when we come down here, you see the tumor ends. There's no tumor down here. So the tumor is actually not coming this way at all. There's no tumor down here. But when we come up here to the top edge of the tumor, we're still seeing tumor way up here. So this is tumor. There's the edge of the tumor right there. So that means we got to cut clear up here. So we're going to be cutting in this direction. The egg is coming this way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the coronal image uh, kind of suggested that. It did, it did absolutely. One exactly. That in your slides, yep. yeah. exactly. And that's what you want to try to connect in your mind when you're looking at your CT or your MRI pre-op and then what you're looking at intra-op doing your ultrasound. You want to try to connect those dots in your mind and try to Make sure you're seeing things right. Because you can easily get fooled, especially when you start rotating the kidney around and moving the kidney. You can easily get fooled. So I'm seeing the edge of tumor is way up here, way up here. And Ronnie, do you recommend that all people that do partial nephrectomies use the ultrasound all the time? Like yes. in helping with the learning curve, use the ultrasound? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, to me, it's not a, it's not a luxury item. It's a necessity. You've got to use uh, it. And I, and I, I agree because you just you get much more facile using it and interpreting it uh, with with, uh, with time and experience. Yeah, I have a nice uh, video clip my fellow worked on actually this nice video clip where we show an example of what looked like a very easy tumor. You can just look at the outside of it and think, okay, I know exactly where to cut. And then we show the ultrasound and it uh, saved our booty because uh, it was much different than what we expected when we ultrasounded it. The tumor was much deeper than we thought and it completely changed you know, our plan for resection. So uh, sometimes it'll save you. I mean, it, it's really, I, again, I say it's, it's not a luxury item, it's a necessity. Don't leave home without it, as they say. All right, so we said we're gonna cut something like this. And then we'll be able to come a little bit more up like this over here. Which 
Okay, let's go ahead and give the green stuff. Yep. All right, so the dose of green that we're giving here is um, we're given a fifth of a cc. And you're probably saying to yourself, what is that? Why would you give a fifth of a cc? That's crazy. Well, because the different, there's a difference between when you're doing it for perfusion and when you're doing it for margin assessment. If you give one or two cc's like you would for perfusion, everything turns green, including the tumor. And it's going to be useless. So what we found is on the XI robot, the SI robot, a half a cc was the ideal dose in the vast majority of patients, about 90% of the time. On the XI robot, the uh, dose has to be less because this, the firefly is stronger. So we have the dose on the XI robot. We usually use a quarter of a cc, but this guy's kind of small, so I don't want to overdose it. So I'm going to start with 0.2 or a fifth of a cc, and then if that's not enough, we can always go up. There we go. So you see how the tumor is not green? And the kidney is very green. So one, this is 0.2 or one-fifth of a cc, and this is the ideal dose that we want. Tumor not green, kidney green. That's what we want to see. All right, let me have the VLOX now, and let's test the needle drivers. So part of our checklist is to test the needle drivers, because the last thing in the world you want to happen when you're on clamp is to have an expired needle driver. So we always test the two needle drivers, make sure they're both, they both have lives. I like to put the needles, the VLOX, or the deep... Uh, for the deep suturing inside the body. Uh, and I just usually on the right side, we'll put them on the liver. And then um, the, um, the, the capsular reconstruction sutures we'll do after we come off clamps, so we don't need those ready to go. Okay, go ahead, guys, with the... Um Turn everything up. Okay, so those will stay there. Now, did we test the other one? Okay, actually, you know what? While I have the needle driver, let me get the ultrasound one more time. Just want to double check my thing here. So we'll make sure this is still green. Yes, tumor's still not. <coughs> Usually the green will take... Um, you know, like 10, 15 minutes to wash out. So it should, should stay there long enough for us. So that's the edge of tumor right there. Right back to here. So we should be okay cutting there. Right to there. The final question. Okay, and then I'm going to check the other side one time. One comment I would make, Ronnie, uh, this uh -huh. is Jay, is I was starting I was, you know, I was always a little bit more conservative on the margins, you know. Yep. And then I kind of adjusted it as I got better and better at, you know, kind of putting the CT image um, in my mind and correlating that with the actual anatomy, you know. So it always helped me to be a little conservative when I first started um, resecting tumors, you know. Yeah, I think that's the way to go, to be honest with you, because, you know, most guys that are going to be doing partials are not going to be doing you know, 200 a year, they're going to be doing 20 a year, you know? So mm -hmm. I think the, um, I think as academicians, the uh, pendulum has tilted a little bit too far towards saving every little nephron, whereas in the vast majority of patients, you know, just do a partial nephrectomy, you know, whether it's five millimeter margin or three millimeter margin, if it's a negative margin, the patient's happy. But to risk a positive margin to save an extra one millimeter of kidney, uh, I don't think that's the best thing for somebody to do. I mean, if you're an academician and you're being held to a very high standard, like at Cleveland Clinic, where they're comparing you with Stephen Campbell's data and whatever, then you may feel the pressure to save every little tiny little nephron. But uh, honestly, that's not my goal when I do an elective partial like this on a patient with a normal contralateral kidney. I mean, if I'm uh, if I'm uh, doing a five millimeter versus a three millimeter margin or whatever, I mean, it's not going to make a difference to this guy for the rest of his life. 
Okay, so let's have the uh, scissor back. Let's do one more wipe and then we'll uh, get ready to clamp. And then part of our checklist or our routine is that we just pause for prayer. I say P4P, everybody in the room knows what P4P means. It's not pay for performance, it's pause for prayer. We just say a, a small prayer before we go on clamp that everything goes well. Okay, so um, we tested the needle drivers. We got the stitches in there. The plan is we're going to clamp. I'll cut the tumor out. You'll give me the needle drivers. We'll run the base and then we'll unclamp. Okay? Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Okay, get ready to mark the time for us. Turn it sideways. Uh, sure, that's fine. Very good. Close. Work the time. Sorry, Ronnie, you're going to hear some of the resident bowl is right across yeah, no, from us. It. I can hear it. They're, um, they're in the final round, I believe. Wow. Before What's they're the complaining about us being noisy, they're too noisy. Huh. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> Tell them we're curing cancers here, you know. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Proving their knowledge. So you can see I made a wide incision in the capsule before I start reflecting the kidney because the capsule is what's going to tether you. So you want to make a wide, I think uh, Clayton was saying that earlier with his video that uh, you want to make a, a wide uh, incision. And then every so often we can check our margin here with our firefly. So if you recall, we said we we're going to cut a little bit downward on this edge, but then we we're going to cut straight across on this edge, which is what we're doing. That was based on our ultrasound. Hold this edge down for me, please. Yep. And then we're going to go all the way down to the sinus fat. That was our landmark that we saw on our scan. So until we see sinus fat, we're not going to make our turn. And if we get in the collecting system, it's okay because we're very lateral on the kidney, so we're not going to make any orphan calyces. There's an artery right here. So you see Renee is giving me counter traction. She is a pro at this. <laughs> she, well, at everything. I mean, at assisting in general. But uh, especially the partials is where I really appreciate her help because uh, she's really phenomenal at this stuff. So there's sinus right there. This is sinus fat we're coming down to. So we're going to get it clean. And again, we can check for the green every so often. Green means go. And if I see any vessels as I'm going, I just buzz them. If I see any arteries, I buzz them. Veins, it doesn't work, but arteries, I buzz them. Because then it's less work for me when I go to sew. I don't have to worry about those vessels as much. Especially out here in the periphery of the parenchyma because it doesn't really hold a stitch very well. So if you can buzz them before they're perfused again, it's going to help. And then this is all extra that I don't need to cut out, but I just want to smooth out my resection for my suturing. So this is an extra kidney that it's not going to work anyway. So now we've finished our resection. We can check our margin. It all looks green, 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 green. Tumor's not green. 
can see the tumor's white, kidney's green, we got a negative margin. So here you can see we're very close, we're on pseudocapsule right there. So that's what it looks like, but it's not into the tumor. Okay, needle drivers. So, Jellet. Who won? Western, Western. section. Oh. <laughs> I think they're plotting for you. Yeah. <laughs> My strategy on this V-lock is that I'm usually trying to do two running sutures that one is on one side, one is on the other. They're overlapping in the middle where their major vessels are going to be and where the collecting system is going to be. This defect is not that wide, so there's a little bit more overlap than usual. Man, those guys are parting. Yeah. Yeah. Did they crack open the champagne yet or what? <laughs> <laughs> So, Ronnie, is this a, a GS21 needle? This is, uh, I have no idea. What is this, guys? It's a V-lock, but I don't know. I don't no know problem. The, yeah, I don't know the difference, to be honest with you. Yeah. It's a 3.0 V-lock, but I don't know the details of it. Yeah, 3.0. And you had a, I noticed you had a lapper tie in the end. Uh-huh. A pre-placed lapper tie. Yeah, we basically, um, you know, we've been using the same stitch for years, so I don't even remember what it is. It's just whatever the V-lock on my card is. Lapper tie this for me. I know we use uh, Hemalock clips um, yeah. rather than, than lapper ties. And then we've switched to the Covidian, the new Covidian yeah. uh, absorbable clips. Do you have any experience with that, Lonnie? Yeah, I used them when they first came out just to try them, but they were like three times as expensive. So I stopped using them. Okay, mark the time. Let's have the 3-0 now. Thank you. Okay, suckiner. Uh, we'll get it later. So we had uh, seven minutes and 17 seconds, Kelly tells me. So I don't think any need for, uh, what do you call it, mannitol or anything? Yeah. So this is usually, this is more bloody than usual. Usually that deep layer gets all the bleeders, but his kidney's a little bit soft here. You see how some of these stitches are pulling through. So I, that's my suspicion is that he's probably bleeding a little bit because of these some of these B locks pulled through. Dr. Lau, how do you do your uh, deep layer? I use a uh, v, basically an SH equivalent to V20 3O, similar to what Ronnie did. Um, I just do one layer, 
but I do the double layer when I'm in large space defect, uh, just just like uh, Ronnie did there. It works really well. So, how about yourself? I use a 2-0 uh, okay. V lock okay. as a deep layer um, yeah, with really double hemo locks. Yeah. So we have two hemo locks. Yeah. Okay, Lampertitis. Then the assistant places the uh, the hemo locks on this side. Yeah. Sometimes these uh, arteries, when you first come off clamps, sometimes the arteries are in spasm and they don't uh, start pumping. And then after a couple minutes, they start pumping. Let's have another one. It's a little oozier no. than usual. I'll, uh, um, another stitch, new stitch. I'll go back and retighten these after yeah. these deeper layers. Yeah, some people will use monocrills for that purpose because they're easier to tighten after the fact. Mm -hmm. But um, I just like that uh, V-lock for the deep layer. Kind of used it for a long time. So we got it down to a dull roar, as they say. <laughs> and I'm going to share with you my secret weapon which uh, some people like, some people absolutely hate. It's my uh, stitches that I use for the uh, capsular reconstruction. Oops. Second there again for me for a second. Stitch reach. Okay, go ahead and uh, lapper tie this. Yeah, this is the downside of uh, doing early on clamping, but the upside is that if you had this kind of bleeding after you did your capsular stitches, you're in a much bigger world of hurt because you can't see what to sew. So it's better, better to have it like this where we can still see it. Man, this kidney's really soft. You can tell when I tighten these things here how soft it is. Yeah, let's put that uh, thing on there, yeah. Good. Uh, I don't think it's catching for some reason. Can you do another one? I don't think it's on. Yeah, look. Better. Problem solved. Ronnie, have you tried that? a Stratifix uh, here? I haven't, no, huh? I'm just no, curious. I uh, didn't see any reason to switch from this, to be honest with you. I just always been using the V-locks for this and didn't see a reason to switch. But then when I started doing the, no. But then when um, when we started doing this, uh, the prostates, the, the Stratifix came out. And I said, man, you know, I wasn't using the V-lock on the anastomosis for the prostates because I didn't like the sawing. And then when the Stratifix came out, I said, oh, I'm going to try this. And I really loved it. So I stuck with it. But yeah, I think the Stratifix would probably be good for this too. Just I never switched. It's just always been on my card, V-Lock. All right. So I think we can bag this. So again, this is our margin. So you see here's Tumor. Green is good. And then this, again, I was showing here before we bag it. So I was showing here, this is where we're getting really close to the tumor, right in the middle there. You see that? 
So there's still some yeah. kidney on it. There's still kidney. We're not into the tumor. It's, it's still pseudocapsule and whatnot, but you can see how it doesn't fluoresce like the rest. So if you had actually mm -hmm. cut into tumor, then that's what you would see. You would see a, a dark spot where you cut into the tumor. Okay, and then let's bag the fat. Okay, can you give her these uh, needles too, please? Give her two of these. Make them six inches, Sarah. Thanks. Okay, there's our one big piece of fat. Good. Oh no. Okay, let's suck this puddle out here before we do the capsular stitches. So this looked like a bloodier one, you know, once we came off clamp, but uh, this again, it's all magnified. This is, a, you know, really not much blood loss here. And, um, you know, our transfusion rate is uh, less than 1% on these. So I think the robotic way definitely is the way to go for partial nephrectomy. Well, you got us waiting for your secret, Ronnie. We're yeah, waiting. It's coming. it's coming. Here it is. We're waiting. We're waiting. <laughs> the secret weapon. This is the secret weapon. Jay, you may have seen this. Uh, I may have shown this in I, Cleveland. I, I have. I have seen yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> so basically what I do is I use the... So the traditional way of doing the capsular stitches would be to go through the capsule into the defect, across to the other side, through the kidney, and then out the capsule. What I do differently is I use these larger needles and then I go deep to the entire defect and come out the other side. And then I'm just gonna line them up like this. And then when I squeeze them, I'm not just bringing the capsular edge together, I'm actually squeezing the entire depth of the tumor bed so that um, you know it won't bleed or leak urine. And basically the depth that I'm shooting for on these stitches, I'm shooting for the same depth as my initial stitches so that I'm not killing any additional kidney by doing this. I'm going at the same depth of that original, you know, that deep layer. Hey, Ronnie, you may have shown this at Norris, uh, I did, not yeah. this past, but the year prior, actually, I believe. Yeah, people either love it or they hate it. <laughs> but, um, you know, basically, you just got to get over the idea of these big needles, using these big needles. But the final result is basically this entire area is just going to be squeezed and you're not going to have to worry about bleeding afterwards. So, you know, my, uh, my um, confidence in this technique is that, you know, I've done almost 500, probably about 500 partials by now. And I've never had one patient go to interventional radiology, not one. No AVM, no pseudoaneurysm, no bleeders that needed to be embolized. Never happened. And I, I really believe it's because of this stitch. You know, so you for the audience, just tell us the needle and the, and yeah. what the, the, the stitch is. So the, um, the size of the needle is uh, determined by the size of the defect. So the bigger the defect, you know, if you're doing a hemi-nephrectomy, for example, you're going to need to use a larger needle than this one. This is the medium one. The smallest one would be a CT1. So the CT1 would help you out with maybe a two centimeter tumor uh, or maybe one and a half or something like that. But how often do you do those? So we rarely use the CT1. So this is the most common one I use, the medium. And then the larger one, so this one is a CTX, CTX needle. And then one step up from this is the XLH. The XLH needle is a huge needle. It's um, the biggest needle you'll find anywhere. But the idea is that um, you can do even a hemi-nephrectomy. You can get an XLH needle to go all the way across the defect. Okay, let me have a laboratory. You want to come back? Okay, we can do it now, yeah. Okay, good. All right, and then we'll remake. So you can see this is putting pressure along the entire depth of the defect now. Those bags are getting in our way.
Okay, remake. Um, so this needle is the, this is a CTX. Give me the strings, just put them in the body. Yeah. So the, um, the CTX needle is the largest needle that will go through a port. And it just barely goes through the port. So to take it out, you'll see we'll have to bend the tip of it to get it uh, out of the port. Yep. And then the, the uh, XLH needle does not fit through a port. So how do we get it in? We get it in percutaneously. We just have the bedside assistant will put it in through here. I grab the needle. I use it. I send it out the same way. So that's the XLH, which is the largest needle. Second there for me. So here I'm just alternating these back and forth. I leave that one in the kidney and I do the next one because if I take this out and I tighten it, then it's hard to see where I'm going to put the next one. So I just leave that in the kidney and then uh, I go for the next one. And then I'll leave this one in when I do the last one. Okay, suck on this side right here. I think I pulled this out a little bit here. Keep that in there. And then this one's gonna come out. Try to go a little bit over here. Okay. So, uh, you know, things that people hate about this. The needle's huge, it's scary. I know, it is. You gotta get used to it. But when you get used to it, you can get it exactly where you want it. The other thing people complain, they say, oh, you're killing all this kidney. All this kidney is going to be dead. I say, you know what? First of all, I'm going in the same depth as my initial layer, so this kidney is already dead anyway. And if I'm going to put the layer on the outside, well, I'm going to be squeezing these edges together anyway. So I don't think I'm really killing any more kidney. If I am, it's not really functionally significant to the patient, at least not that I've ever seen in clinically in any patient that I've operated on. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a different thing. It's, it's different. You either like it or you hate it. But I'll tell you what, I sleep well at night. Some patients I send home the same day after partial because I've never had, um, you know, I've never had a patient go to IR. I've never had any kind of AVMs or pseudoaneurysms, whatever. So if the patient feels good, wants to go home today, he gets to go home today, which I don't think I would feel comfortable doing if I didn't have this layer in there. Okay, let's, uh, let's do one more. Let's do a remake on this one. So we made these at six inches so we could get a couple stitches out of it so we don't have as many needles going in and out. Any questions from the audience? How do you guys do your anarchies? Uh, yeah, go ahead. So uh, they do this I, too. You guys don't do this. Come on. Same thing. <laughs> Outside, I I, I <laughs> haven't done this, uh, but I like it. it. You can see how easily it came together pretty quickly. Um, but I usually do a horizontal mattress on the outside, or a bigger tumor, or if not, just just interrupted vicrals, you know, the standard technique. But uh, how about you, Jay? I, I I've done this on the larger defects. I've yeah. never done the XLH. Um, that's a big needle. Yeah, I mean, that's he's, the biggest one. That's a big needle, big. Yeah. Um, but the the CTX is actually pretty manageable, um, like what he's got going on here. So I think this works nice. Um, for the the trade off is that you're you're not you don't have a V lock. So sometimes for the smaller defects, I'll just do the horizontal mattress with an O V lock, um, and then that's a, comparable to a CT1 needle. It seems like it's you know it comes across naturally, like it doesn't, it's not as steep, mm -hmm. so it almost like a Keith needle, I guess. But so it seems like it's natural for it right. underneath. So usually, um, you know, when I have visiting surgeons who come and watch me do this, we do a visiting surgery surgeon uh, program once a month, about once a month. So uh, when they come and they watch it they either love it or they hate it and then whenever i present it in conferences i always like to ask people you know who is uh you know who absolutely hates it and who who likes it because there's never people in between and it's usually about 50 50. so maybe you can pull the audience for me and see what people think ask people you know if they like this or they think it's absolutely horrible you want to start over here about dr harris tell us it's 
So we got a maybe. Does that count, Ronnie? A that's maybe. That's a first. That's a first. I'll take. I'll take a maybe. I will he take likes a maybe. It, so that's probably closer to a yes. I will take a maybe. Do you have any comments, Dr. Harrison? Dr. Lai? He's a little concerned about the depth, as we talked about. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, that's what I was saying. You gotta, you gotta go after the same depth as that initial layer. You know, you don't want to go too deep. You gotta try to get into that same layer as the initial deep layer, because that's already an ischemic zone. Oh, this is sliding. Can we get another? Yeah, initially I was concerned about the depth too, um, and then I realized that my deep layer is deeper than I think. Yes. You know what I mean? My deep layer is actually a lot deeper than I than we think it is. So I think you're right, Ronnie, in that it, it is analogous when you put these stitches straight across. It's pretty analogous to your your initial layer that you put in. You know. That's the goal. I mean, that's what I'm trying to achieve, basically. And then now I'm cranking the hell out of it. I'm not, uh, I'm not being uh, wimpy on the cranking because basically I know it's not going to tear out. It's deep to the entire defect. If I was just grabbing the two edges, there's a pressure at which I could crank on it that it would just tear out. But here I can crank, crank on it and get super physiologic pressures on it so that, again, I don't have to worry about bleeding. And if I missed a little collecting system defect or something, you know, that one is sliding too. Put another one on here. So uh, basically, uh, Abaz is sleeping well at night when he does partials. How often would you say you're sending uh, patients home, and, and what, what kind of criteria do you use uh, the same day? Um, I don't have any criteria. If they want to go home, they get to go home. It doesn't matter if it's a hemianephrectomy, if they're 80 years old. If they want to go home, they get to go home. But, you know, I'm not saying I would recommend that to everyone. I think you just have to look at your own patient outcomes and see, you know. I didn't do yeah. that from day one. I started doing that after doing several hundred. So, you know, after several hundred partials, I saw that, you know what, these patients do well. They don't, they don't need to be in the hospital. You know, we're not doing anything for them. They're just sitting there and, you know, we get them up walking and whatever. We give them some IV fluids. Why are they in the hospital? I don't know. All right, well, let's send them home. So that's basically what we did, and you know they do fine. But now, if you're doing partials less often, and maybe you're not as confident that you're gonna have you know no bleeders or urine leaks or whatever, well then keep them in the hospital, no problem. It doesn't hurt to be in the hospital for a day or two. I'm just saying that you know if you're confident in your outcomes and you know that you're not gonna have any problems by sending them home, then you can send them home. So that leads me to my next question about drains. So um, how often are you putting drains, if any? Three percent, three percent of the patients. Yeah. So we're in, you know, this is just the last time I looked at my data, but basically we're into the collecting system about two thirds of the time, but we only leave a drain about three percent of the time. And my urine leak rate is less than one percent. Again, because of this stitch, I believe it's because of this stitch. I mean, Jay, so. very, very infrequently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's basically to help me sleep at night for that one yeah. or two patients that you sometimes get across, you know? Yeah, I think with time and over the last few years, even like nephro use, I, I rarely use drains anymore. Most patients go home the next day. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess if you need it, you need it, but it's pretty uncommon. Yeah, we, um, you know, we wrote um, a couple of years ago, we wrote the paper in Journal of Urology of uh, avoiding drains in robotic partial nephrectomy, and the uh, editorial was pretty scathing. So I invite people to go back and look at that and see that, uh, you know, what was, just to, just to get a, a look at what the predominant feeling was at the time about, you know, just this, this dogma of using drains on partial nephrectomy. And uh, I think the pendulum has really shifted now. I think the majority of people are getting away from using drains, just very selectively using them. And just as you get more experienced, I think you get more comfortable just getting rid of the drain and not using the drain. You know, same thing with pyeloplasties. I mean, when we first did robotic pyeloplasties, that was the rule of thumb, drain. When uh -huh. we first started doing ureteral surgery, drain. You, like you said, nephro-U, drain. Partial cystectomy, uh -huh. drain. Everything was drain. But then, you know, over time, I think we've gotten more and more confident with our ability robotically to get watertight reconstructions to the point that, you know, we 
very rarely, you know, use a drain. I mean, if I'm calling for a JP drain, you know, my staff is like, well, what's going on? What's wrong? What happened? They think it's something's wrong. It's very rare. And then they're asking me, what kind of drain do you want? Do you want a Blake drain or a JP? And I'm like, um, what's the difference again? They're like, flat or round? I'm like, uh, I don't know. Ask my fellow. <laughs> So here I'm just closing the gerotas. So this is why I like to uh, mobilize the um, kidney within gerotas. The question came earlier whether you mobilize the kidney inside of gerotas or you mobilize the gerotas with the kidney. So this is the reason that I like to keep the gerotas intact on the kidney because then at the end I'll just close the gerotas over the top and, um, and then uh, kind of restore the, uh, this kind of protective layer here. Kind of like... Um, you know, when you have a renal trauma, but it's contained, you get a hematoma contained to gerotas. You know, this does, I think, give you a little bit of extra insurance. But you can't just sew fat, you gotta have gerotas. You know, you gotta have that kind of fascial kind of stuff. Otherwise, it just tears out. Suck here for a sec. All right, put a clip on there. Good. All right, guys, that's our final result. Any uh, last-minute questions from yeah. the audience? Going once, going twice. Yeah, great job, Ronnie. Yes, sir. Yeah, great. And thank you for... All right, thank you guys. Talk. Appreciate the opportunity. Fun, and thank you for the, uh, the expert moderating and everybody in the audience for coming. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of the AUA, guys. I'll see you next year. I'll be there Thanks. hopefully next year. Thank you, Dr. Abaza. Bye. Thank you, Stacy.